Hi, everyone. I hope you can all hear me uh, and see me. Thank you so much for joining the last session of Transform Work and welcome. My name is Andrea Wade. I'm a portfolio director for AIML, Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning at iSIMS, uh, the leading HR cloud platform for recruiting. And I will be your MC uh, for today's speaker panel with Daniel Fellows, Amber Brown, and Tracy Keogh. As you may know, the Transform series is a new free online seminar that explores the growing impact of digital transformation on business and society. Uh, we'll be covering a total of six areas ranging uh, from future of work to smart cities and communities, circular economy, and many more. Today, however, we are focusing on future of work. We're delighted to be joined by Daniel Fellows, founder and CEO of Get Optimal, Amber Brown, product solutions manager at iSIMS, and Tracy Keo, co founder of Grow Remote. Feel free to send in your questions during the session using the Q, uh, Q a function. You'll find it at the bottom of your screen. Please be aware that the chat function is disabled, so only the QA tab. Uh, works for this uh, for this purpose. We will then complete uh, uh, compile the questions, and I will ask the panel uh, to address as many as they can towards the 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 end of, of of the panel. So, looking forward to your questions, and please just remember to use the key, uh, Q and A function as the chat is disabled. So, with no further delay, um, I'll hand you over to our speakers, um, who I'll ask to um, show themselves. Hi, Dan. Hi, hi Andrew. Uh, hi, Tracy and Amber. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I know that I did a small uh, intro there, but it would be good to, to do a proper introduction, uh, introduction. Tell us a little bit about yourselves and also about your work uh, and, and organization. So I'll start, I guess, with the first person that uh, uh, turned their camera on. I'll, I'll, I'll go to you, Dan. <laughs> you win because of that. So um, uh, just a, a few words on you and your work. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Uh, delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. My name is Daniel Fellows. I'm the founder and CEO of Get Optimal. Uh, we optimize job ads for diversity, inclusion, and SEO. Uh, I previously worked as marketing director for Indeed.com and a couple of other companies uh, around marketing technology uh, previous to that. Really excited to be here today. I uh, know we're going to have a great conversation. Uh, I don't think there's any right or wrong answers currently, but I think we're all sort of um, going on this path of discovery and learning together. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, uh, that, that's great. Um, I'm, I don't actually know who was first, Tracy or Amber, but Tracy is next on my uh, screen here. So let's go to you. Yeah, only if I knew if it was, it was a race. Um, my name is Tracy, a co-founder <laughs> of an organization. We are a, a, an award-winning social enterprise, a nonprofit uh, called Grow Remote. We are on a mission to enable us to work, live and participate locally. And we do that by making remote work both visible and accessible. To date, we run in 130 uh, local communities across 17 countries, run two training programs for those who are unemployed and people managers, both free, um, and ran over 400 uh, local and national events. So for us, uh, we're really excited to be here and we're really excited for the transformation of work, most, uh, mostly for uh, the impact that, can, that it can have on our lives and how our local communities can grow and sustain themselves. Thank you, Tracy. Last but not least, um, Amber, if you want to say a few words. Yes, of course. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Amber Brown, and I'm a product solutions manager at iSIMS, which is a talent cloud solutions provider in the TA and HR tech space. Um, I'm based here in the U.S. in a state of New Jersey, which is in a, a town outside of New York City. Um, I focus on bridging diversity and inclusion into technology in an ethical and eloquent way. Uh, so I'm excited to be here. Uh, and another fun fact is I do partner very closely with Andrea and her AIML expertise to kind of get the job done. So elated to be here with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. So hopefully uh, those watching us uh, uh, today and in the future as this is uh, um, uh, being um, uh, recorded, uh, get an idea of what everyone does. Today we're talking about work transformation, right? And amongst ourselves, um, you've heard my uh, introduction as well. We cover areas like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, so AI and automation, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion, uh, remote work, all these things, all these areas that really power work transformation and have done so uh, 
at an accelerated pace, uh, if you wish, in 2020. Um, so I'd, I'd like us to think about, and as you, the viewers, are, are thinking of questions to ask, uh, today really we're focusing on remote, AI, ML, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So with that, I guess we're all here and not in front of you. We're all on a call. Um, this year has changed a lot for us. Suddenly we're all working from home um, uh, and we're all working remotely. But is that what remote work is. And as we talk about these areas, I think it would be good to anchor them and define them a little bit. You know, what is remote work? Is it working from home, living at work? Uh, or really, what is it? And how has it changed this year? But also uh, um, in the last three, five, whatever years, I know that we saw more and more of this. So Tracy, uh, I'm looking at you to start this off with and, and, and your work, what is remote work? So that's the question that we started off with. So in Grow Remote, we're mostly community development people in our local communities. So like farmers markets, GAAs, digital hubs, whatever. So we had heard that remote work was like something that could help us. And we were like, really, what is it? Let's find out a little bit more. Is this just hype? Um, and since that day, 2018 until now, we've really played with words and language. Um, and our latest term for what is remote work, right, is, is location agnostic employment. It's certainly what we focus on, right? So that can be, if you look at um, the offerings that the likes of uh, maybe Doist would have, so when they're really kind of leading remote, remote companies in terms of their culture, et cetera you get employed with them and you can choose to work from home or co-working space or from the when, when you when you join them you have options and then you decide where you want to be and you, and you base yourselves there so COVID has really thrown up kind of what is remote work and um, I know one of the arguments we've been seeing against remote work is not everybody wants to work from their you know their box room in their house not everybody has I'm like no who does like I don't nobody does so it's not about that it's about uh, flexibility and choice uh, fundamentally um so that's for us, we currently term it location agnostic employment. And obviously this area has been accelerated um, because of today's situation. Um, we And those of us who are privileged enough to be able to work from home, we're doing it now. And I think this is probably has changed how we will work in the future. We heard so many companies already announcing that they're not going back to the office or they will offer flexible schemes or they have uh, you know a, a percentage of their of their employees um, can work remotely forever. Um, I, I, I have friends who have opted in for, for, for that. And I know when we were prepping for this call, we talked also about the past. This is, you know, 2020 has accelerated many things and many transformations within work. But I know that, uh, Dan, through your work previously, you mentioned indeed as well. Uh, this, is, this is not a 2020 thing. We, we've seen this desire, uh, 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 you know, manifested uh, from, from employees, this desire of wanting to transform how we work. Yeah, 100%. And, and Tracy will probably touch on uh, it being quite culturally specific. I, I speak purely from my own culture, which is very much UK or EMEA, but obviously Amber, the culture in the US, uh, remote working. I know my teams in the US were remote when I, I worked in, in New York. Um, we did a study at Indeed about, about three years ago um, across all of the job ads in the EMEA region. So uh, obviously in Dublin, in, in France, in, in Holland, in Belgium, in Germany. Uh, and it was it was huge, you know, it was millions of job ads. What indeed is incredible at it's a data aggregation platform as opposed to really a search engine for jobs, but they create 25 terabytes of data a week, which is uh, which is a lot of data. But we, we found there was only, uh, out of all of those job ads, let's say 10 million, I can't remember the exact number, only 7% of those job ads mentioned a term like uh, flexible working or remote working as well, which was which was incredible to us because we found in the survey that we did with over, I think it was 20, 30,000 candidates across the MIR, that 93% of these candidates three years ago wanted to have the flexibility around where they worked, uh, the location, and obviously the time as well. So uh, back three years ago, if we can remember, Back that far, we had what we call a candidate-driven market. That means that there isn't enough candidates for the amount of jobs out there. Now, obviously, that's been flipped on its head a little bit because we have, you know, hitherto millions of candidates coming into the marketplace. 
but we still have huge uh, shortages around nursing, uh, around programmers, uh, software developer, medical professionals, uh, industrial relations, things like HR as well. So we're going to talk about it in a moment. But if you can think that not only do you generally exclude candidates through gender bias that we, we find a lot uh, get optimal, but now you're excluding potentially wonderful, brilliant, inclusive candidates because of where they live or the fact that they can't jump on the bus and get into Dublin or or jump on the tube into London or, or drive an hour and a half down the road in, in New Jersey to get into the office as well. So it's uh, absolutely, to your point, Andrew, it's massively accelerated uh, what Tracy called, and I, that's my word of the day, location agnostic employment. Um, but again, it's it's something that people have wanted for a long time. The industries that I work in, uh, particularly recruitment, it's always been a matter of trust. The recruitment companies don't generally trust their employees. That for me is a huge issue generally. Uh, but again, it's um, it's something that is, is really important. One of my teams shared me uh, an advert from Aviva, a very large insurance company, I'm sure you're aware. We don't come across many good job ads. We don't come across many job ads with empathy, like uh, Andrea, we work a lot with AA, AI, and ML uh, around optimizing the process of job ads. But Aviva talk about, uh, we always care, and I'm quoting, uh, it's our thing, we're all about our people, that's you, so we can be pretty flexible. If you want to work from home some of the time or change your hours so you can pick up your kids or care for someone in your family, we're very open to that. In fact, we don't advertise roles as either part or full-time because we know each person has different needs, just as each business area has different needs, so it's up to you to discuss working hours during your interview. I just wanted to share that. It almost brought a tear to my eye. I just thought it was it was lovely. And we never, ever see that amount of flexibility. Whether or not they actually do it, I don't know. Um, but I'm pretty sure they they do. Otherwise, they wouldn't be printing it. So just wanted to, to bring that into the discussion today. Yeah, thank you. And, 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 and you know, thank you for bringing up uh, diversity, equity and inclusion in, into, um, in, into the discussion, um, because I was going to look at Amber next. And, and, uh, and of course, all these things linked together, all these areas that we are discussing today on this panel, uh, enabling some of these things, um, uh, some of these solutions um, that aim to solve some of these problems. We're using AI and ML. Uh, remote work is enabling diverse pools uh, to be able to participate in 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 uh, um, the workforce. Um, so Amber, looking at you and uh, uh, the work that you do, and I know that we the two of us work um, uh, quite closely. Um, but if we look at, you know, we we, we sort of anchored uh, remote work in this. 2020, the year that we will uh, uh, not forget very easily, uh, and and the circumstances around the pandemic, and and this year, and not just this year, you know, we've we've looked at all sorts of socio political movements and you know we had racial justice and we had the meat movement and we, we're suddenly we it seems that we're truly talking about what matters um in a way that it matters uh, and we're taking actions but what is really if we talk, think of employers organizations what is diversity how do we define it mm -hmm. and what is it Yes, it's kind of like alphabet soup, right? First it was diversity, then it was diversity and inclusion, and then you have diversity, equity, inclusion. Now people are throwing in like justice and culture. It's like, we'll have like a never ending acronym, but if we kind of focus on the most common one, which is DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, we start with diversity. And in, in my opinion, this is the easiest to wrap your head around and then it kind of gets more complicated as you get down the, the acronym. So diversity is about representation from people of all walks of life. Um, and it's about the things that you can see at the tip of the iceberg, but also the things that you can't see. Um, so an example for me is you look at me, you can see one layer of diversity um, and you probably know that I went to college and you know we just talked about this and got my master's, but I'm the first generation college student. Uh, that experience is very unique for me and my family, right? Being the first one to go to a university and get a degree. So all of these different elements make diversity. Um, equity is a little bit more tricky. So it's about removing barriers in uh, an eloquent way um, in order to kind of level the playing field for groups that are underrepresented or historically have um, barriers that are systemically placed in front of them um, over time. It's very 
difficult to un undo some of that. And so companies are trying to figure out how do they accomplish the E um, once they get past uh, you know, the hill that is diversity. And finally, inclusion, it's making people, allowing people to have a seat at the table and having their voices heard and being respected for your uniqueness and the value that you bring. Um, and companies are also trying to figure out how do they do that. So it's one thing to kind of tick box and say, tick boxes and say you have these different people in your organization, but are barriers being removed from them when they're trying to get promoted at different levels in the organization? Are they equitably compensated and are their voices heard when they're bringing new ideas to the table? Um, so all of this is a, a dance that has to be figured out how to be made uh, very pretty within an organization. Um, and they're trying to do this while remote. Uh, so this is a, a huge transformation that we see, and I'm certainly thankful for um, the catalyst that 2020 has been. Uh, for me, that is the silver lining. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I know we touched on the fact that, you know, working um, from where I, what did you, I need to, I need to take agnostic. Location agnostic, location less. Sometimes I think we might okay, have agnostic. <laughs> uh, uh, being able to work from wherever uh, really does enable diversity as well. It transform works for so many people that, you know, we're not able to participate. Tracy, looking back at you, what, who needs uh, uh, to work from wherever? Who needs remote? If, when the work, when the world goes back to uh, 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 somewhat a normality, who needs to and who wants to? So we started off with people in rural areas, right? So um, if you think of any demographic, and it's really interesting to hear your approach, Amber. It's it's really interesting to hear from somebody who studied it, right? So I think I run a lot on emotive and feelings and gut instinct, but it's, so it's really interesting to hear that. Um, but anybody who has a barrier in society who's at any level of a disadvantage has an added barrier because of where they live. So we actually need to remove that first. And then you just have your standard, your standard, you know, disadvantage or, or, or bias against you. So for us, we started off with rural uh, locations because we had people who needed to live here, who wanted to live here, who just didn't have access to career opportunities. And like Amber said, we might have um, access to entry level role that nobody really in the organizations really care about. But you go to look for a promotion. They're like, who, why are they on that island doing that work? Who are they? So it, it's a, it's, it's, it was a huge piece. We learned them pretty quickly, um, about six weeks in, when uh, Dublin City Centre opened up as a local community that actually this had a transformative power um, in lots of people's lives. And there wasn't actually one really demographic in terms of there was a young guy that I always use the case of. He was in Dublin his mom had cancer, he wanted to move home uh, to Leitrim in Ireland and he couldn't move home because he needed money to be able to live and there were no jobs um, back there so he wasn't able to look after his family, he was really young um, whereas there's another woman in Dublin City Centre, a single mother, a newly single mother, it's three kids, uh, they were old enough that she could be in the house and work away, they wouldn't disturb her but not old enough that she could uh, leave the house and leave them there so without remote work she wouldn't be able to generate income uh, for her family so it is really wide reaching and I suppose from from our perspective in, in Grow Remote we need to make sure that employment reaches everybody everywhere um, and it goes far beyond it crosses so many you know we would say our problem is borderless our solution is borderless but it actually crosses many other kind of facets of human life. And can I ask just to follow up on that uh, um, and, and stay with you, Tracy, and then go to Dan as well. What kind of, you know, if you were to look at industries, the types of industries that are adopting this and they're more open, uh, the types of roles that you see out there, you know, what do you see most? Who is, who is uh, uh, open and able, uh, I guess, to, to do this? So tech is number one. Don't let anybody, that put anybody off. That's just where the market is now. I don't think it's going to stay there. Uh, second, we're probably, particularly in Ireland, call center customer service. Uh, that's really big. And, and the model for a company transitioning their call center remote or work from home has been done. So like any company can really pick up that playbook and deliver it. So that makes it easier as well for that to happen. But more and more, we're seeing organizations, um, say like GitLab or all remote, where every part of their company, whether that's admin or legal or finance, that they're all of those roles are remote. And that's paving the way, I think, for the next generation of remote. So in Ireland, when we concentrate just purely on, on Ireland, we're looking at working with a number of large Irish institutional employers. 
who are more traditional, older, older sectors, and um, to encourage them to adopt a, a partly remote workforce because the future uh, is, is most likely hybrid. And within that, we would like all roads and all levels. Now we'll see how we get on there. But so currently, I think Kate Lister is a is a researcher in a, in remote work. She built a, a product called well, a place called Global Workplace Analytics. It's where everything to do with remote work sits. And she says that remote work used to be just for the top 7%. And so you'd have people who'd get trusted at very senior management who could then move back to our communities uh, and push up the prices probably in our local communities as well. We wouldn't get access to those jobs. And then you had the bottom of the ladder jobs. But what we're seeing now, and I do think this will continue, is the ladder from entry level all the way up to that kind of senior exec. So I know that's not a straight answer, but I would say tech is the predominant area now where the jobs are. Don't put that off because there are there are other um, jobs there now, and I think that will evolve in time. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. I have a, you know, I have a lot of friends. A lot of them are in tech, but a lot of them are not, and they have been able to to transition. Uh, people who work in NGOs, people who, um, so I can definitely see that more and more types of companies are adopting this. Dan, you see a lot of jobs, right? Uh, too many, way too many. Yeah. <laughs> what do you see you know again it's pretty much the same question what kind of industry what types of jobs and where do companies go right and wrong and just to align with what with what you and, and get optimal uh do as well when they put these out uh in front of of, of candidates uh i mean it's a fascinating conversation because we're all uh learning together obviously trace is, is is much more advanced within this subject and as I said at the beginning, I don't think there is a right or a wrong answer, but uh, a mutual friend of ours, uh, we were, uh, Chad Soash, Andrew, we were talking to last week, and he was talking about the broadband should be free because one of the biggest aspects of, of remote working, working from home, location agnostic, is it's the economical impact as well, that some folks genuinely can't afford to, to, to have broadband within their, their house, or whether it's heating as well. There's, there's a lot of different sort of social economic uh, factors uh, at play here. What are we seeing at Optimal? Uh, we've had to adapt our own technology to reinterpret remote roles. And we've probably seen about a 70% increase in remote roles in uh, probably about the last nine weeks. So once companies know they can do it, then it's it's that process, well, how do we do it? Uh, and uh, a guy called William Tinkup just coined the phrase hiring from home, you know, very, very original, but how do you, how do you hire from home? How do you source from home? How do you do the interviews? How do you onboard people into your business as well? How do you, a key thing we'll probably go into a little bit, but the culture. Culture is, for me, the most important aspect of any company. How do you build that culture remotely? And I think we're all we're all sort of learning together and making mistakes together. And you've got to be quite brave to make mistakes because we all will, because that's just the nature of, of human being. But again, it was fascinating what Amber was saying around the diversity. We are seeing companies, and you should look up a company called uh, Vesida.com, we work with those guys and their clients who really are looking to bring in uh, the DE&I into their business genuinely. It's not tokenism, which is, is what we've seen historically. Uh, obviously, in the US, you have the, the OFCCP uh, guidelines. So it's it's federal laws that a percentage of your job ads need to go through a diversity job board. Uh, I think I'm very optimistic whilst COVID-19 has been horrific for everybody. It, it does also represent a huge opportunity to drive and uh, to drive forward better diversity and inclusion goals within our workplaces both physically because uh, we will go back to the office or we'll have a choice to go back to the office or again if we do that remotely i don't know i don't have all the answers of how we do that remotely but i definitely see from the conversations that i'm having predominantly with larger companies um, that they really want to understand what they're doing wrong and really want to uh, the tools and the education, I think that's the key thing really, it's that they don't know what they're doing wrong. When we talk about their job ads, when we point out, you know, uh, the gender terms, the pronouns, the gendered language, you must hit the ground running, uh, et cetera. These, you must have a uh, tenacity and driven all these sort of uh, very heavily masculine words. They're surprised, you know, they're the authors of these job ads, they don't understand it. We then point out around accessibility. In the UK, we have 26% of our workforce are registered disabled. So they don't think about the fact that someone that's coming to their website doesn't actually know how to apply because their uh, their, their website isn't, isn't accessible. There's, there's, no, there's no volume over the apply button, for example. There's a huge amount of education. There's a lot of uh, people that I deal with have got a real misconception around what DNI is 
and accessibility as well. But I think it's 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 not even a discussion anymore around the fact that diversity is an incredibly positive thing for, for any business. You look at all the McKinsey studies that they've recently done, it shows the correlation between a diverse workforce and a diverse C-suite uh, into a, a much more happier, more productive, more financially or commercially uh, productive business as well. So uh, I don't know if I've answered any of that question, Andrew, but I think it's incredibly complex. And I think as long as we sort of learn and, uh, and, and, and sort of grow together and don't be too afraid of making mistakes that we'll, we'll find. And again, it's everything. It's the compromise. It's the solution. Uh, we talk about different generations of people that are happy, like me, not to probably be going over Dublin for this, this webinar. Then I'll be getting back to City Airport at probably half past 10. And then I'll be tired and grumpy all weekend because uh, I hadn't slept properly. But I, I can do this now. And in an hour and a half, I can go and collect my kids, which is which is a an occasional delight, not a delight every day because they're kids. But, um, you know, it's that flexibility and it's that choice that, that people should have always had. But now, to everyone's point, COVID has accelerated that, uh, that requirement. Absolutely. And I definitely do not miss um, the same day flight um, to London. I do miss London, but not the same day flights when you wake up. <laughs> really early and you come back that evening uh, and that was I think those were 95% of my flights in the last five years going over there it was you know you go in the morning you, co you come back in the evening um, then you mentioned you know how do we do this how do we uh, hire from home how and we're really going into solutioning right we know that these areas have been accelerated for so many reasons uh, and that's great uh, but in order for us to, um, you know, function properly in this new in this new world, uh, we need solutions. And everyone here is a builder of that. We're, we're building for our industry. Um, so Amber, looking at, and I know that the work that we do, right? Uh, we we very. If if I look at the top of the funnel, because we're talking about hiring people, hiring people remotely, hiring people inclusively, high, you know, and and solving for that top of the funnel. Uh, it might be external or it might be internal. It could be internal mobility. Uh, again, Trace, you made reference to that. Um, uh, what are the solutions that we are building? Uh, you know, what do we see out there? What is the market asking? Um, and I know that here we said we talk about AI, we talk about DNI, we talk about working um, uh, remotely. And by the way, I just want to uh, make sure that I, I, I ping the audience. Please do send your questions. Use the Q uh, Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and, and do send us questions. Um, but we're talking about all this, and I know that us at ISEMS, you know, with your role, Amber, and everything that you do, and uh, we, we, we've looked at this area of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we said we don't want to be the sort of company that thinks of these as an afterthought. We want to build with that in mind, so that everything that we build is with that in mind. It's not a DEI feature. It's a feature mm -hmm. that includes that. So it'd be good to just, uh, you know, what do we see out there? Thank you, Andrea. I believe there's like a foundation that has to be understood before we like get into the tools to your point. And Dan referenced it perfectly earlier. And if you blinked, you probably missed it. He referenced trans work transformation where you have you, the fact that you have a strategy in place to enable remote work but then that introduces other socioeconomic barriers. If companies operate where they're focused on one thing or the other, they're gonna miss the ball. That's why you see like a, an increase in job ads that are asked, looking for heads of diversity and inclusion because that individual or their organization should help keep the pulse of the of leadership to say, hey, if you do this, you also have to consider this from a diversity, equity, inclusion standpoint. And so you don't miss the mark. It has to be integrated in everything that you do, not bolted on at the end. So if you're going to start putting out more jobs ad ads for remote work, do you actually have a strategy in place to compensate people to make sure that they have a comfortable workspace, as, as Tracy mentioned earlier, um, to enable them to work from anywhere um, and, and all of those pieces. So it requires a bit of strategy and thinking about it um, like, 
being woven in a fiber, being woven in a piece of fabric. Um, and that's like the visual that I always go with. And so from a solution standpoint, it's not linear, it's, it's cyclical and it's, and everything in between. Right. And so the top of the funnel, um, is, is one thing from a sourcing perspective, but people are even looking at pre top of the funnel. How do we get out into the younger community and, you know, give access to a uh, coding lessons to, to, students that wouldn't really have access to this uh, type of skilled uh, work. And um, how do you kind of go out and do that philanthropic activity so that way eventually these people are more, there's more of them at the top of the funnel, right? So that's one strategy. Then you have, how do you source target sourcing at the top of the funnel? And so programmatic advertising to find underrepresented, um, underrepresented affinity groups and meet them where they are is important. Um, so you see a lot of partnerships with different institutions like Society of Women Engineers or historical uh, Black colleges in, and universities here in the States or Hispanic serving institutions to build relationships so that way these people understand who your company is and what the culture is at that company and that they can be represented there. And so when you start advertising to them, they're like, okay, I've, I've heard of them. I feel like I might be able to belong there. Um, you know, they've had some events and it seems like it's represented well and so that programmatic advertising helps at top of the funnel but then you get into the recruiting process of this and that's where this whole thing of bias comes in what good is all of that effort at the top if you have unconscious bias kind of uh replicating the the same type of individual through the funnel and to the top of the ranks and so we see um in the market a need for redacted resumes and sometimes it's off-putting like why are you redacting this information do you not trust that i would have in my best interest but people have to take themselves out of the equation and just understand that these tools are here to help us do good and um, so redacted resumes is a huge one, programmatic advertising, and even using skills-based matching. So the power of um, AI ML to parse skills and match them against the skills in a job and not look at names or universities. We, we've heard a lot about um, elitism. And if you went to a specific institution or university, you might have a leg up in the process. And so we say, okay, AI ML says, take all of that out of the equation mathematically do these things kind of be, are they kind of the same distance apart? And you probably know that, okay, look at this individual that you probably would not have considered. And so those are the big ones that we see, uh, AIML matching, uh, programmatic job ads and redacted CVs. And there's some other ones that we're conjuring up, but I'm gonna keep those uh, proprietary and close to the chest. <laughs> Definitely. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff that we have on our roadmap. And then, of course, the industry is, is looking at all these things as well. Um, Tracy, in the, in, in the world of remote, uh, what are, you know, some of the solutions? Like, how do you build for that? You know, how did you build for that? Where did it come from? Uh, and and if, if you lift out of, of your own org and if you look at what the industry is doing, what kind of solutions are needed in order to really enable, um, you know, working from anywhere, I guess. I think this conversation is so, so interesting. So firstly, Daniel, I did not know that hitting the ground running was gendered language. I, I would say that all the time. I think it's because we're in that kind of startup mode or like hit everything really. Um, but uh, so this is really interesting, you know, that even that obviously it's just, it is. And, and, and Amber, as you're speaking there, um, as you're speaking there, it was actually just reminding me of um, uh, a conversation that we had. It was a year ago, but just always stuck with me. So. We again have local communities that are set up uh, in, in local communities uh, by volunteers and um, what, what we find is that people who are in these rural communities um, are used to um, certain, it's a bit like college, like maybe you don't expect to go to college because nobody else has, so you're like oh it's probably just not for me and you kind of just then disregard it and um, I can't do that. But there was a guy on a, in a pub in Armour Island, Armour is off the coast of, of Donegal, it has about a population of 462 people. And I'm not sure if you can hear my dog barking. I hope you can't. Um, but he's a he's a young guy, right? So he's about 20, 23, and he really needs to stay on the island. The island really needs him to stay there. Um, and so we met him in the pub. 
when we were having a few, few drinks and uh, he said, you know, that you can work for Shopify, for example, you know, 29,000 starting off. That's like way more uh, than he was earning and he'd be able to live at home and all of that. And so I was like, super, he was getting really excited. I said, super. So I introduced him to a, to a recruiter um for in in shopify and he didn't get back and so i rang him a couple of weeks later and i was like hey you know just wondering did you did you follow up and he said oh i didn't was i meant to respond what what, what should i have said um, and it was a confidence issue so he didn't know how to talk to thing because it seems like oh my god they're in a tech company and i know that feeling well you're like oh, i want that so bad i actually don't know i'm gonna freeze um and so what I realized at that point is that local support of a community who are there to support you and go here, no, I got a job there. Like I am not, you know, they, they you normalize it. It's exposure. Andrea, um, I often uh, in my own head think of the conversation that me and you had when we were hiking and there was a thing on called a hardware hackathon in Ireland. And uh, she was like, you should go. And I was like, what, what's hardware? What's hacking? I have no idea. I just didn't know. And she was like, what? Don't ask. Doesn't matter. Of course, of course, you know, it's fine. You'll figure it out. And I, she gave me the confidence to go, actually, I don't really need to know all of it. And we ended up winning uh, at the pitch. We, we ended up winning the whole hackathon. Yeah. But before that, I suppose, and it is sometimes just that somebody reaching out to you locally and going, of course you can do that. Yeah. And you don't, don't even, don't even consider it. And then the support before, during and afterwards. So, um, how we kind of frame it again, because we look at it from the viewpoint of our local communities, we say that we, our local communities are in a self-perpetuating downward cycle. So it's like, I don't know if you know the broken windows theory where um, the, the main street, the health of the main street reflects the health of the overall community. And so the vacancy rates in our main streets are decreasing still, and that's a trend from before COVID. And so then we look bad, people don't want to come here, then it goes round and round. And we want to intercept that by, by bringing in employment in ones and twos. But in grower mode in general, we reach out into the community. It's like that pre the top of the funnel, the pre the, the, the before the top of the funnel. Um, and then we then we do the skills and training again, free of charge. We have employer partners, Amber. So you mentioned that thing around they become familiar and then you think oh, I, I could belong there. I know what they do. So employer partners are a big part of our training program. And then people come out of our training program and into the community again. And so it's a self-perpetuating circle just the other way around because the people who come through that that process want to help others and it starts all over again. So, so that's a very long answer, but uh, that is, that's the answer, my answer. Oh, that's, that's, that's a good answer. And that's good insight, really, in, in thinking how, how do these solutions happen? And very often the point of panels like these, the point of discussions like these is there's many it's a learning session maybe it's an inspirational session as in somebody figures out that they can also do something um we're all learning here um so that i would you know that was a perfect answer uh dan just looking at you and then this to to everyone as well we're talking about solutioning and and you know you you are literally looking at that point of entry hey i i have an opportunity i'm talking about it uh, but what you've learned very quickly that the way you talk about it, you know, first of all, you might not be found, you're not seen, uh, you're not projecting the right thing, but then the consequences of not doing that when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion and so on. So uh, the same question to you as well, what do you see in this? How do we solution for, 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 for the space, for these trends, for these work transformation pillars, I guess. And then for everyone else, I would also like to ask, uh, because we are in Ireland, in the UK and in the US, what are the differences, if any? What are we learning when we build and solution and listen and get feedback? And so, you know, are there any differences? What do we see across the globe? Um, just to go back to Tracy's point, which was incredible, um, I think Confidence is, is, is quite a learned skill. Um, it's not something that everyone has naturally. I know that I don't have natural confidence. Um, I think most of us are faking it till we make it. Um, I think it's important to say that as well. And I remember having an interview um, at two companies previously where I was global marketing director. And the guy that came in was a uh, suit on. He was, he was sweating. It wasn't a particularly hot day. He was terrified. He was terrified. I think he was gonna be a content editor. Uh, and obviously I've, I've suffered from anxiety and panic attacks for 20 years. So, you know, I can, I can spot it better than anybody. So I said, right, come on, we went over the road, we had a coffee. Uh, I said, take your shirt off, you know, sorry, not the shirt, that'd be weird. Uh, take off your tie uh, and your jacket. Just, st he starts rolling up his sleeves and he's got tattoos on both arms. 
and we start talking about stuff and it, it turns out that he's a, a published author. He likes to, he wrote about uh, medieval fiction, sort of 15th century. And I couldn't stop him talking for an hour. And uh, I said, oh shit, I've got another meeting, I've got to go. Uh, c- come back next week, come in your jeans, t-shirt, uh, come and meet Jamie, the CEO, and we'll chat. And he got the job and he, he stayed for two years. So I think uh, confidence is something we learn and we build and we get better at. It's not something perhaps that comes naturally to us. Um, but yeah, I know interviews as well are, are pretty pretty horrendous for most people, but um, practice, uh, practice, practice. And um, yeah, I think we're all faking it till we, till we make it. Um, how do we solution for it, Andrew? That's a... That's uh, an incredible point. I think very basically from a from a HR perspective, talent attraction, and obviously I'm biased. My bias is towards job ads because I see a lot uh, and the majority of them are fairly horrendous, but it's the first time a candidate will come into contact with your business. It's the first time a candidate will learn something about you, about your employer brand, whether you are a, a GitHub or whether you're with Facebook, it could be a local a local corner shop or, or a local pub or restaurants as well. So why would you not take as much care and attention within that job advert to talk about your business, to talk about potential missions, talk about the job, the role, the responsibilities, whether it is location agnostic or a specific location as well. You know, on average, we find 14 mistakes per job ad, whether that's gramming, gramming, uh, grammar, uh, spelling, punctuation. If you're reading a job ad and people can't spell within that job and it's going to reflect incredibly badly uh, across your your employer brand you know everyone is working so hard to, to to build that positive sentiment around a business and it can be let down by these these small things and that's not just anybody that's not a, a recruiter or, or someone with a talent traction team or marketing everybody is constantly making huge amounts of stakes within their job ads we talked a lot about larger staffing customers so recruitment consultants take away the copywriting from the recruiter. You didn't hire that recruiter because they're good at writing. You hired them because they're great at sourcing or they're great at placing somebody or they're great at negotiating or they're great at finding those hard to find candidates. You didn't get them because they can write a great job ad. Take away often that anxiety from them, the part of the job that they they least enjoy and obviously give it to us, give it to, to other companies that are more specialized uh, to, to do that. I think going back to the education uh, piece again, from what you're doing, obviously at iSIMS and and Tracy as well, incredible work that that you do. It's it's helping people get through these different scenarios and these different challenges as well. Most people have got already too much to do in their everyday. So this is just throwing even more complexity in terms of what they want to do. And also you've got to do the thinking for their line manager, potentially their boss as well. And you've got to get them through that that stage. Um, We, from an artificial intelligence, point of view i reached out to our sort of technology um guys and girls this morning uh, around how we're looking at biases within optimal and they sent me about lots of really really uh technical stuff which i won't go into too much but they talked about and you probably know this andrea about the um the model fair learn which is around assessing biases and within algorithms which is something i've only become aware of in the last couple of uh, last couple of days because often uh, people talked about before um, Donald Trump became president, they were saying, actually, the biggest danger to, to the world or to the US is not Donald Trump, but it's it's the coders in Silicon Valley. It's the predominantly white males who are coding the algorithms of for, for these huge social networks as well, which, as we know, you know, sort of filter bubble within networks, you're only getting commentary uh, or, or, or content based on your own uh, bubble or based on your own sort of circle network as well so i think you know the our ability now still not too transparent but hopefully that's going to change in the next 12 months about how we can hold ourselves uh, an optimal and an isims and what you've done previously at opening and, uh, and other businesses we can actually see not all of the algorithm of course because that's the secret source of the business but at least we can make sure that we're not continually perpetuating old biases which we were doing in the analog world we're not perpetuating those biases sunshine that's unusual um, we're not perpetuating those biases in technology. So I think uh, that, that cognitive, that sort of awareness piece is incredibly important. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's, that's uh, thank you for bringing in, you know, algorithmic bias in, into the discussion. Um, very often we, you know, I, I talk about, I, I used to give this talk on, on AI bias and I talk about, 
you know, who who should build these systems? And, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be just the devs or the data scientists and, and what do they look like and who else's voice comes to meet, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the solutioning of these things. And I often talk, when I talk to our customers or, or whoever wants to listen, um, you know, that over 50% of our data science team is, is female. And a lot of the things without getting into details, a lot of the things that we do, um, they're stamped not because we know that this is the right thing to do, uh, but not because a customer is asking, perhaps there is a personal story there. Someone has experienced something when trying to get a job or go through you know, uh, uh, this industry that we serve and they came across a problem and it's highly personal and, and, and we solve for it. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, um, absolutely. So I, I've asked, this is really for, for everyone, um, uh, but um, what are the differences? And I know that you, Amber, you've, you've worked a lot in the last year, uh, although you're based in the States, with, with Europe. Um, so you do have an overview of um, a cross-continental uh, <laughs> view. So what are the differences, if any, uh, between yeah. how we're thinking and looking at, at, at uh, these areas? Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, over the past uh, nine to 10 months, I spent a lot of time with customers outside of the US. Um, so some of them were like digital media companies that were based in the UK. I talked to a tech consulting company based whose headquarters were in Switzerland, um, a construction company also in the UK, a frozen foods company based in the UK, but they have massive operations in Germany, France, Netherlands, Canada. Um, so I wanted to get out of my bubble and see what's going on in, in the world, <laughs> like outside of like what I know. And I was just fascinated. And so when we talk about, I'm going to stick to, because you can even talk about like LATAM, Asia Pac, but I'm going to stick to like the research that I did, which was primarily Europe and, and the U.S. In the U.S., we have a lot of um, like laws and regulations of um like reporting, you kind of have to have a reason that you are rejecting an individual and it can't be because of, you know, their, their race or their gender, um, kind of equal employment law, right? And so what we've seen is that in the US, there's more consistency with the questions that you ask on an application for people to self-identify who they, who they are, uh, their gender, their race, their ethnicity, disability status, um, and disability goes into like mental health as well. So not just your physical disability, there's a whole list um, that include uh, mental um, obstacles that you might overcome and also veteran. So the one stark, dis stark difference is that in the US we focus on um, capturing military individuals. And in Europe, I found that that was not as prominent. There's no um, specific question or recruitment process to target individuals who have served in the military. So that's just one clear difference. Uh, the other thing is we have a more standardized way of collecting this data. And so for these larger companies that might have sites here in the US, they've used the way we collect data to kind of introduce how they wanna do it in their other sites in Europe. However, there are some companies that are uh, based in Europe that have been more advanced with the types of questions they ask. And so I'll give you an example. Um, one company was focused more on the socioeconomic status because they felt in the UK, um, there's like a big emphasis on elitism. And so they ask specific questions in the application that would uncover if someone maybe got free or reduced lunch in school, or if they had any type of uh, support from like local food pantries or whatever the case may be in order to get more insight into that person's socioeconomic status. And that was very unique. And I thought it was brilliant. I said, wow, this is incredible. This is really like diversity and inclusion. And so I felt that in certain instances based on the company and their maturity, they were actually more willing in Europe to venture outside of what you can collect as a standard based on some, some law and kind of get more creative. Um, also, I've seen uh, some companies uh, based in the UK also ask if someone is going undergoing a process to transform their gender um, and they want to collect this data to do good. And so a lot of them are starting to put disclaimers as to why are they collecting this data. They want it for statistics and they want it. They want to know because they want to provide more benefits to cover that type of thing if there's enough representation in their funnel. Right. So people can have, you know, 
appropriate like coverage, let's say, for that. And so um, I found that the US was kind of lagging in some of those progressive areas, unfortunately. And I found that it was very progressive in certain uh, places of Europe. Oh, and one thing that I did want to mention is that uh, from the sourcing perspective, I'll be really quick. Um, a question that I did not get among the 30 customers I spoke to in Europe, um, but it comes up more frequent in the US, um, and it could just be my sample size, is people talk about like reverse discrimination in this sourcing strategy. Um, and that is something that was very US specific. And I was almost like shocked, uh, but not really shocked. And so I think our culture here in the States lends itself to kind of having more companies that might be a little bit more susceptible to enforcing these types of strategies because they don't want to get pushback that they're only hiring people because of who they are. Um, and so while that's disappointing, I kind of understand like culturally why that happens here. And so we kind of have to work hard to, to educate people on what are we doing? Where are we doing it at the top of the funnel? And what does it mean? Um, and we're not promoting tokenism and only hiring people because of this. Um, we want to do good with this. So, yeah. Sorry to butt in, Andrew. There's, there's a word that Amber uh, mentioned. I've learned so much today, by the way. <laughs> this is, I've never written so many post-its ever uh, on the session. Uh, you talked about self-disqualification. Um, that's Again, that's a new terminology uh, to me the last couple of months, but we found that with job ads, with the bias in job ads, how people are self-disqualifying themselves from the process. Um, just wanted to throw that in. It's a, it's a sort of, when you stop for a moment and you think the, the output of what I'm doing is potentially disqualifying or sub-disqualifying 50% of the available candidate pool here, it's kind of insane, isn't it, a little bit when you say that loud? Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think um, oh, I think we all learned a lot today and I, I just love this discussion. Um, uh, we're slowly coming to end uh, in about eight minutes. So we'll take some, some questions. So again, encouraging you that are watching and listening, please ask us whatever you want to ask. Um, um, there is no bad question so please feel free to do that so we talked to you know the topic of you know today's topic is very it, it's work transformation we're talking about where we work how we work who we work with why do we want uh, uh, to encourage things like diversity equity and inclusion some of the tools that are powering some of the solutions that are built around this you know powered by ai uh, uh, and so on are these things made to last. Um, Tracy, if I look at you and we talked about this uh, um, working from anywhere, I guess, what happens when some of the world goes back to what we knew as normal? Are these changes here to last? And I'm asking this from, 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 from uh, uh, everyone really. Uh, and where I'll look at you um, uh, about something that I was reading about, you know, the rise of uh, um, employee activism. And I know that you're one of the founders of I Belong and, and, and you know, it'd be great to say a few words about that. But overall, are, is this here to stay? So uh, I'm afraid that it's not. So my, so my kind of default is it's definitely not. We need to work really, really hard to make sure it is. So, uh, but I think we're, we're probably cautious in that, right? So there definitely is an element that's here to stay. We just need to make sure that we definitely um, drive it on. So I think um, obviously we're coming out of a pandemic. And so I think a natural reaction for everybody is go where the other humans are because we'd be very excited to just be around people. Um, and so once kind of, once the balance of power is back in an office in perhaps a city, then it's like a magnet. Everything will be pulled back there. And so we, Daniel mentioned briefly around uh, culture. So in our experience and in my own experience in Betting Remote Work in Bank of Ireland, there are kind of three different components that need to shift. Your policy, your technology, and your culture. Through COVID, technology has kind of really been pushed through, right? The tools have up their, up their game, as have, you know, uh, internal tech teams. Uh, you know, there's companies who ordered hundreds of laptops in one day. Um, so all of that is done. And we're lucky that that kind of companies will now look for a return on that investment too, right? And so remote work can provide that. Policy is doable and the government in Ireland will release a strategy before the end of the day. Culture is really difficult. End of the month, sorry, not end of the day. Uh, culture is really difficult and a remote first culture is something that we know unlocks, um, unlocks it for uh, everybody. 
And often we hear when we talk about remote culture, well, I want to work in the office, remote first culture. And it's kind of, sometimes it reminds me of, you know, an international women's day. And they say, what about the men? You're like, yeah, I know them too. It's just that this day is for this thing. So in remote first culture, it's more about, I guess, inclusion of everybody, right? So it's not, it's not like you have to be outside the office and stay there. It is inclusion of everybody. And that's the work. So in our, in our kind of experience in Grow Remote, we have toolkits for all, all remote. We have toolkits for everybody in the office. We don't have toolkits for hybrid and we don't have toolkits for the transition. So we, uh, as an organization, need to work to develop those. And, and that's our kind of next big action for change, really. Um, so we're working on a model that will embed remote working, but that needs to happen uh, in the, the Q1 of next year, in my opinion, for it to stay. Thank you. There is a question that came in and uh, it says perhaps a question for Tracy. Um, we'll ask it. Uh, I'll just give everyone else the opportunity first to um, answer, um, you know, is this here for to stay? And Amber, I made that point with um, uh, the rise of the employee activism. Yeah. Employee activism is not going anywhere. Uh, people have found their power in their voice and in who they are. And once you kind of realize your uniqueness is a superpower, like nobody can tell you different. So uh, we've seen people... Uh, be more willing to ask uh, specifically during an interview, what is your company doing about diversity, equity, inclusion? Do you have stats that you can share about the representation? What, is your, what are your strategies to doing better? What does your board look like? And these are just questions that like a candidate would never ask, but people feel empowered to do so. Um, but as you mentioned, I, I'll touch on this very quickly. Um, I'm a founding member of I Belong, which is a grassroots diversity and inclusion uh, group that started at iSIMS actually, but it started with just four or five of us and we're 30 strong today. Um, and we've been able to have a seat at the table uh, speaking with our executive leadership team and really have infused ourselves in all areas of the business um, from marketing and communications to events and product and engineering. And so that's that's kind of how my role was born. It's how do we uh, have these individuals have a seat at the table in all of the things that we do at ISIM so that way we can get cultural belo culture, belonging, and inclusion right, not just in one area, but in every area. And so that type of employee activism is really empowering, and we see a lot of other companies following suit. And so I don't, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's here to stay and on the rise. Dan, what about you? Everything that we talked about today, uh, where is it going? Does it have legs? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, 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 one, with my left hand, I feel very, very optimistic. Um, obviously, it's it's been uh, it's been pretty upsetting watching what's been going on in the US this year specifically. Obviously, in London, um, we've been on a couple of Black Lives Matter marches. We're raising the awareness, the education piece. Um, around how this has to stay this this absolutely feels like this is a moment of change and you know individually everybody watching we all have a, a personal responsibility to educate ourselves into the why um, I think it's not employee activism but it's people activism I called my, my mate Mike last night he runs a couple of pubs locally um, night Mike for 20 years he's a black guy from Sheffield he gets stopped in his car probably three times a week still by the police um, that, that, that's really upsetting, but he's like, no, no, it's normal, it's all right. Said, no, it's not all right. I'm a white middle class guy, I never get stopped in my car. So that that still upsets and, and depresses me hugely. But I think with, with with people like Amber in this world, you know, with companies like Get Optimal, with what Andrew is doing at iSIMS, how Trace is educating, we all have a responsibility to take this forward and to not not let people off the hook. You know, I think building a culture and Seth Godin is an American, America, an amazing American. Uh, cultural commentator and marketeer, but he says that, you know, culture is as important as your strategy in so much that the culture should be your strategy. So I think we've all got responsibilities to try and build that culture, to to be brave enough, to, to be caring enough, to allow anybody in our business at any level to say, no, that's, that's not right. You know, that's not acceptable in terms of maybe whether people act, their behavior, uh, their language, uh, their mindset. But you have to create a culture where we can openly challenge authority. We can openly challenge um, someone that's not got it right. I don't necessarily uh, feel we should be shouting people down, but we've got to sit down and we've got to talk and we've got to come together and we've got to explain. And we've got to find you know, a, a way forward that in 10 years time when my kids start going out or maybe not Tracy or staying at home, working location agnostically, 
they're there working in a much more inclusive uh, workplace because I know that I and into my last jobs I haven't um, and, and that's something that I'm very very passionate uh, that we maintain in 2021 absolutely going forward and we're not we've got a, an amazing footballer you know Marcus Rashford in the UK that I, I don't want footballers taking knee in 10 years time you know that is just incredibly accept, upsetting that thought so I will be the optimistic realist that I always am and yeah I'm I'm very I'm very excited about the potential of what's begun this year and also where we can uh, where we can take it forward. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I know that, you know, when we talk about some of these things, when we talk about diversity, equity and inclusion, a lot of the conversation obviously has been stemmed out of various different world events uh, and so on. But this is such a, you mentioned earlier on Versita, and I remember when I first went to their website and I was, I was seeing diversity mapped, you know, you might have a learning disability, might be a veteran, you might have, there's just, it, it, it's such a vast area that we're all still learning from. I have a friend who's a little person, uh, right? That, that we are, as humans, uh, uh, you, you know, we're, there's many nuances to us and many attributes to us. So I think it's, it, it's an area where we're, we're only beginning. Um, so um, absolutely. Um, and we have a responsibility um, um, to design a world like this. So. Um, we're at time in terms of questions, so we're now taking questions. Um, so uh, I will read out one question that came in here. Um, it says anonymous attendee, so I can't refer to, to your name, apologies about that. But um, perhaps, and I guess everyone could, could answer that through their own experience, but perhaps a question for Tracy, do you think imposter syndrome is more present in rural Irish towns? Why do you think this is? Um, you saw maybe imposter syndrome, maybe confidence building, I'm not sure, but I think um, if you don't have exposure to something, you imagine what it's like. So you imagine that like the leaders in or the people on like who are really thriving in their careers know everything and they're just just perfect and they're, they're, they're not like you and, and you can kind of, it, it's strange to you. And so I think for 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 those reasons, you can, it's back to self-selecting yourself out of a process. Um, and that's why Grow Remote needs to go and get the employers, partner with them so that they're, we're the kind of conduit for getting them to reach into our communities to do it. So I would say definitely, um, I, I would say definitely, like there was a, I think Tume in 2018 was the only area to increase their unemployment rate, you know, after they got uh, broadband and, and things that people think will, will fix the problem and actually a lot of the infrastructural stuff isn't really the problem uh, it is it is a lot of the more human and softer things um, and in rural Ireland sorry we just um, aren't used to having equal access to opportunities so it's weird uh, for instance one problem we had and I'll finish off on this is that um, uh, remote work and work from home is usually scams. So when we first went around talking about work from home, they were like, are you selling a pyramid scheme? I'm like, no, we're not. <laughs> so we had to start saying uh, like pensionable jobs. And that's how we used to, and again, back to our, our use of language, pensionable jobs um, we used to talk about so that people would understand. So I'll eventually get to less long-winded answers, but uh, that's my... <laughs> Wow, that's actually fascinating. Um, okay. Um, so I, I guess the last question before I thank you all and before we wrap up, uh, what are, and this is again for everyone, what are you most, out of all of this, what are you most excited about? I'll go first. Uh, this is no gender bias on this panel. Um, I think I'm, I think now it's it's acceptable to call people out. It's acceptable to challenge. Uh, it's not acceptable to to be abusive. It's not acceptable to to shout to rant. Um, but this year, and talking with you know relatively senior people as well, but also I was chatting to a couple of people, younger people last night, just to try and get more review about today's panel. And uh, apologies, I forget who made this point. Amber, I think absolutely. They will go into an interview and they really want this job. But they equally want to know about the, the makeup of the board. I, I think, um, yeah, you mentioned that. And also, how are you planning? Uh, I'm a diverse uh, candidate coming in. Where do you see me being in 18 months? 
that really, really excites me because I, I've sat in way too many interviews where it's purely, purely for the candidate to convince my business of why they should be joining. Um, and I love the fact that candidates are getting braver, they're getting empowered uh, to actually ask those, those, those difficult questions, which, which hand on heart, I should have asked 20 years ago. My generation should have done a lot more and we, we didn't, we, we failed hugely in some ways you could say. So uh, I love uh, the absolute confidence, whether it's genuine or whether it's learn uh, of the, the growing generations to, to hold people accountable. And that, that really, really excites me because then I think folks like myself or, or Andrea, we can come and support and maybe provide that infrastructure to enable everyone to, to succeed um, and thrive, you know, emotionally, uh, physically and financial, financially and collectively. Same question to the rest of you as well. What are you most excited about? I can be quick on this one. So for us, um, Mission and Grow our motives to enable us to work, live and participate locally. And so we fo focus in on work because that's kind of a lever to allow us kind of first principles approach to community development. But we're actually really excited for the other two parts. So what happens after? When employment, when you can have secure employment that goes with you no matter where you are, all of a sudden that access to employment unlocks everything else for so many people. It's such a fundamental part um, and if you can drive equal access to employment, just in terms of even location to start off with, I think it's transformative uh, for everything else, where people move, how they move, how they live. Um, so it's, yeah, it's the everything else for us after the work. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to think whether I want to go tech or just like, you know, my, my gut instinct. So I'm going to go gut instinct since, you know, it's just different than what I do on the daily. Um, I'm excited about the rise of allies and what that means for like the unsung candidates. Um, I think what we've seen this year in terms of active activism and people speaking up is that, um, you know, we have people who are in our, in your out group being an advocate for you. And that means everything. And that's how you're going to kind of help bridge gaps within an organization. And so an example is, is you, Andrea, I mean, you're just such an advocate for me when I am in the room and when I'm not in the room. Um, and so your level of influence for people who uh, respect you kind of helps me grow in my journey. And we see that kind of starting to take place in various shapes and forms. So uh, again, being able to call something out when you see it, um, even if an individual is not there is really important, but also being able to advocate for someone else um, whose voice might be traditionally um, unheard is, is critical. And I'm excited about uh, that, if I had to kind of take it without a tech lens. What about you, Andrew? What are you excited about? <laughs> I was getting teary-eyed there. I was like, okay, what's happening? Uh, I, I was thinking about this uh, as you were all thinking about this. And I'm also taking the people route. I'm excited about people and working with good people and that people want to make change happen. Uh, either if we build technology, uh, you know, we build it with the right data, we're doing it respectfully, we respect the candidate, we respect our, uh, 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 our clients, we help them understand, you know, this changing world, technology is changing, there's just so much change, so much to learn. Um, so, you know, this, this leadership at every level, uh, right? And the opportunity and for companies giving this opportunity for people to, to speak out. So I'm very, I'm just, very excited about the opportunity to work with good people. Um, that's really what I care about because I know that once you have that, you can really change things. So anyway. <laughs> okay, well, I think we're at time and I really enjoyed this. So before wrapping up, I just wanna thank all of you. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for the openness, for all the insights. Um, really, really appreciate it. Um, I think this was a really interesting call. I hope those listening and, and, and watching us feel the same. I'm, I'm pretty sure they do. And I know that this, this, um, this will go on um, um, on YouTube and whatnot, so we can, we can share it with others as well. Um, so thank you. And before I close, I, I just need to uh, go over a, a couple of things. So for those interested, the Transform series will continue in January. 
on the 25th until the 29th with the change in consumer. The registration link can be found on the DCU Business School and the Dot Lab channels for everyone who would like to listen in. Uh, stay safe and, and thank you again for joining and thank you for the platform uh, to DCU and for uh, Dot Lab. We, we've worked closely in, in the past with, with uh, Opening, with the company that I have co founded. Um, they're great partners um, and, and great facilitators and a great platform, um, I'm sure, for the students listening in or watching as well. So thank you, everyone, um, and uh, enjoy your weekend. Stay safe and catch you later.